Here's an introduction to ground-based telescopes to accompany Chapter 6 of Astronomy from OpenStax. So first I want to just mention you know, why am I separating telescopes into ground-based and space-based. Um, it's because we can't place every telescope on the ground. So the atmosphere you know, acts like a sort of filter um, and so only certain light it turns out can you know actually make it through so if for instance these uh, shorter wavelengths this higher energy photons x-rays gamma rays they're absorbed by the atmosphere that's probably a good thing or you get burnt just by walking outside uh, more or less immediately um, the longer uh, radio waves the very long wavelengths these are blocked by the ionosphere uh, surrounding our earth and then, um, you know, the infrared is also blocked uh, by a lot of moisture in the air. And so you have a little bit of infrared that makes, th makes it through. Uh, most of the visible light, some of the ultraviolet, and the radio. And that's pretty, pretty much it. So then the ground-based telescopes are focusing on this optical region. So this is the ultraviolet, visible, infrared, and uh, radio are ground-based telescopes. And then for observing... Uh, X-rays and gamma rays, you know, you'd need to go into space. Um, there are telescopes in space to observe these other wavelength regions as well. We'll talk about that in a future uh, lecture. But basically, you know, we have the optical window and the radio window. So that's what we're going to focus on because these are our ground-based telescopes. Let's take an example of an optical telescope. This is the South African Large Telescope, SALT. So, you know, modern uh, telescopes for research in the optical use uh, mirrors, they're reflectors. And so a beam of light will come in, it'll hit a mirror, and the mirror is shaped such that the light, wherever it hits, will wind up getting directed to this, um, this is called the payload in this particular telescope. So this is just whatever your light detector is, and maybe there's other, you know, stuff in there. And so... Uh, one point here is that the mirror need not be a continuous chunk of material like, you know, like the mirror in your bathroom. Uh, more often than not, these mirrors are actually segmented, and here you see many hexagons, and these are the many different mirrors that are inside of uh, salt. There's a couple reasons for segmenting. Um, one is just practical, so if you have to manufacture a very smooth surface, it's more practical to do this if it's smaller. Uh, it's also, you know, makes it easier to install if you have many pieces to add together. Another one is technical. There is some technical benefit to having these separated. And that's that when the telescope maybe warps due to, for instance, temperature changes, uh, these individual mirrors can be adjusted. They can be warped. They can be moved up or down to improve their ability to reflect light to the proper location. In... Uh, most optical telescopes, there's not just one detector system there, there's often a suite of detector systems. So in the case of SALT, we can look at this payload, and there are different um, mirrors here that can reflect the light to various detectors. Uh, you can filter certain frequencies of light, you can separate light into different wavelengths with the spectrometer, there's lots of different things that can be done. I just want to emphasize, this is just one example. Um, so here is SALT uh, in a comparison scale to many other telescopes. So these are, these are to, um, you know, to one scale. So just for reference, you know, you have a tennis court or a basketball court, probably been on before. So here's that telescope. SALT, pretty darn big, lots of little hexagons. You have others that are of comparable size, but really just, you know, a couple of massive mirrors. And then in the near future, there are going to be even huger, um, you know, very large optical telescopes, which just shows there's quite a wide variety. Um, all of them are reflectors, but you know, you need not have a special uh, geometry of, of mirror. Uh, there's lots of different ways to, to do this. So there are some environmental factors for optical telescopes. So we know from the uh, resolution of our telescope that we, we want to have a relatively large diameter. And we know from just in terms of collecting area, we want to have a large aperture and a large diameter. 
but it matters where we place this telescope uh, because of environmental factors. So clouds are bad, right? If, you're, if you have a telescope on the ground, clouds mean you can't look at the sky. So you need to find a place that is not cloudy. So typically this favors somewhere, you know, tropical or desert-like. Uh, humidity is bad. And that's because a lot of moisture in the atmosphere can, can absorb and reflect light and in, in general just, you know, kind of deflect it and ruin your picture of space. So you want to go to a dry place. So this, again, favors a kind of desert-like or mountaintop-like environment. Uh, city lights are obviously bad. So um, if you've ever looked up at the night sky, right, if you're anywhere near a city at all, you can tell it's, it's pretty hard to see. Um, see much. You can maybe only see a couple stars, for instance, if you're in downtown Columbus. If you're out in uh, Nelsonville, you can see a whole bunch of stars at night and um, maybe even the Milky Way on a dark night. So city lights are bad. You want to go to a remote place, you know, typically uh, 100 miles or more from any major city if possible. And turbulent air is bad. So it what I mean by turbulent air is it's, it's just like it, on a plane ride, you know, when you experience turbulence, that's mixing of the air and the atmosphere. And this also winds up kind of deflecting light in a unpredictable way, and, and it can ruin your picture of space from the ground. So the, the key here is often to go to high altitudes because the air is um, more smoothly behaving, it flows in a more smooth way. So basically what this means is you got to go somewhere very nice up in a mountaintop. And so um, it's a good gig to be an optical telescope operator because it means you you probably work somewhere very picturesque. So just some examples here, you know, in Arizona, Hawaii, uh, very large telescope. And then in the Canary Islands, um, the, these are all just some some examples here. So very big telescopes up in nice places. I don't know about all these telescopes if you can visit them, but you definitely can visit Keck if you go to Mauna Kea on the big island in Hawaii. Um, so there are still some issues here. Even if you do all of the right things, you go to your, your tropical mountaintop, uh, your desert mountaintop, there's still going to be some turbulence in the air, still some moisture. And so often these uh, telescopes have adaptive optics. So, you know, uh, like I mentioned previously, you can tilt or warp the mirrors, and these are based on real-time atmospheric measurements. I don't know exactly how they work. Uh, somehow it, it involves typically shining a laser into the atmosphere and looking at the, the behavior of that laser, but to be honest, I, I don't know the details. So they're, they're really, though, measuring real-time atmospheric conditions and then modifying the, um, the shape of the mirrors within that telescope, and that helps remove or mitigate some of the remaining issues. Uh, due to being on the surface of the earth. Um, you know, still, if you want to do even better, then you can go into space. And so the Hubble Space Telescope is an optical telescope that is located in, in space. And, and because of that, it gets, you know, extremely uh, clear images. And it's, it's still, you know, one of the leading optical telescopes, even though it's been up in, in space for, for quite a long time now. So how do we detect the light? for an optical telescope, that is done with a CCD, or a charged coupled device. Um, it's, it's like the same technology that's in a nice digital camera. Um, it's not the same that's in your cell phone in all likelihood. Those are called CMOS detectors and they're different. Um, the CCDs are more expensive and, and higher performance. And the basic picture of how these things work is the following. So light is going to hit your uh, CCD, hit the sensor on there, and a photon coming in is going to free an electron. So that's something known as the photoelectric effect uh, postulated by Einstein uh, you know, more than a century ago now. And so that, that's a commonly known effect. If, if light you know, hits uh, typically a metal, you're going to free an electron. Uh, what happens with your CCD is you don't want those electrons to fly off anywhere. You want to collect them. And better yet, you want to trap them in place. And because if you trap the electrons in place, then your collection of electrons, how many you collect, tells you how many photons hit that particular pixel. And you know, if you know how many photons hit each of these pixels, um, then you can, you can make an image, right? So you trap it in place by a voltage, 
And then as you can see in the GIF here, when you want to collect that charge, you basically change the voltage on the neighboring pixels such that you transport these charged particles out. So these uh, negative, you know, these electrons are going to be attracted to a positive voltage. So you put a positive voltage, they'll be trapped. And then what you can do is kind of walk them along in that, uh, in that process. Uh, another trick here that's kind of a finer point, but a fun fact to know and tell, is that because of the way these CCDs work, they not only give you um, very good optical images, they're very efficient at light collection and give high resolution pictures, um, but you can actually increase your field of view that you'd otherwise have. So normally if you think about a ground-based telescope, or even a space-based one, you might be able to only look up in one direction, um, or, or maybe you could tilt in a few directions, but let's say in, in principle, sometimes you can only look in one single direction. And if you didn't, um, if your detector system were just like a photographic plate or a piece of film, then basically your light would leave a streak across the, this piece of film. You know, you'd see, if you just left your shutter, camera shutter open, you'd just see the brightness kind of streak along. What you can do with the CCDs is you can time this charge transport to match the motion of the sky across the CCD. And so if you think about it, you know, these, these stars, if you're just looking up, relatively speaking, it looks like they're traveling above because the Earth is spinning. What you can do is you can time the charge transport to match the motion of the stars, the motion of the sky across the CCD. And that allows you to basically collect light for a very long amount of time uh, and get um, just more photons, which creates a better picture uh, for these stars. Um, and so you can vastly increase your amount of the night sky that you can see with your telescope. This is something known as drift scanning. And I know that's a bit technical, but I think it's, it's a cool point, and that's why I wanted to bring it up. So then, you know, what else do we sometimes want to do? We want to do spectrometry. So oftentimes we don't just want to collect light, we sometimes want to collect light uh, by various frequencies or of a specific frequency. So, you know, your, your light comes in, and what you need to do is somehow separate it. The old school way that's, that's not really used in modern telescopes anymore is you send your light through a prism. And so the white light enters the prism, and as we know, the blue light spent more than the red, and then you can send that um, onto, uh, for instance, a lens that will then focus the light uh, or bend it onto uh, some kind of CCD or photographic plate or something like that. So you can separate light, and then you know that, okay, the light I collect in this one region is the red light, this is the green light, that's the blue light, and you've separated it. Um, and, and that can be useful because, you know, for instance, you may remember from the introduction to light that if we know relatively how much red to how much blue we have, we can get an estimate of the temperature of that object. So that's one reason why this can be useful. Um, or we maybe want to separate out the spectrum so that we can get elemental abundances, because as you remember, different wavelengths of light correspond to a different uh, atomic transitions, and therefore you can get the abundance of various elements. So this is something we often want to do. The, the newer way to do this is to not use a prism, is instead something called a diffraction grating is used. And this takes advantage of a quantum mechanical effect of light, um, the, the wave interference, and that winds up uh, causing the light to be bent at, uh, at different angles here. And if you want to know exactly how this works, you, you're going to have to take uh, modern physics or the uh, undergraduate quantum mechanics class. We'll teach you about that. So our other type of ground-based telescope is a radio telescope. And so this is a, a really awesome example here. This is known as Green Bank. It's in West Virginia. And what you have here is the light is, uh, again, reflected and uh, collected. But what's different is this is an optical, it's radio. So you don't need a mirror. What you need is a conducting surface, so just a piece of metal, right? So this conducting surface winds up reflecting the radio waves. And then rather than collecting on a, on a detector, you know, you can't collect radio waves with a CCD. What you instead use is a big old antenna. That's what this, this thing is here. Um, you know, in principle, like the antenna that you have on a, on a car. Um, so the, the radio light is, uh, is deflected into the antenna, you know, based on the shape of the, 
that dish here and uh, can then be collected. And so the antenna principle is basically that a radio wave can come in and it will cause charges to oscillate in the uh, conductor, in the antenna, so in the metal, and that'll create uh, alternating current that can be collected. Um, this one's a little bit backwards. Instead here, you oscillate charges uh, to generate radio waves, but it, it works in, uh, in reverse as well, which is kind of neat. Um, one thing I just want to mention here is there are lots of types of radio telescopes, and you actually need not have a continuous dish. So uh, for very long wavelengths, it doesn't actually even matter that it's continuous. You sometimes see things that really look sort of more like a scaffolding, which is kind of neat. So the resolution limits uh, for a radio telescope, we've, we've talked about this in the past, but they're pretty daunting. So recall that your, your angular resolution that you have is the wavelength divided by the diameter of the dish. And if, you know, typically the radio waves that we're interested in are, are long, right? You're something on the order of a meter. So you need a huge dish to be able to resolve kind of anything at all. And so, um, there's basically only two ways to increase your resolving power. You need to either build a huge telescope, and this has been done, or you need to build an array of telescopes. So um, just as, a, as an example, a very famous um, radio telescope that recently was destroyed, um, uh, partly due to hurricane and partly due to neglect, is Arecibo. And this thing is a 305 meter uh, diameter uh, uh, dish telescope, which is really remarkable. Um, so the, the way that you can kind of read this then is the, the vertical direction gives you the diameter of your aperture, um, or the baseline of your array, which we'll talk about in a moment. And then the, uh, horizontal direction, this tells you your resolution that you'd have. And then the diagonal gives you your wavelength. And so if we're interested in some of the, um, radio bands that's like here, then we follow the diagonal line up to our... Um, to reach the diameter of our telescope, and we can see what the resolution is. And for instance, Arecibo, this is one arc second of angular resolution, which I'll um, talk about in, in a moment, uh, what an arc second is. It's, it's just one three sixty hundredth of a degree. I'll we'll go over that in uh, an equation in a moment. So just for reference, in the visible, that's the same as a four inch telescope in terms of angular resolution. I mean, you, you can buy a 10 inch telescope for not even that much money. <laughs> so for radio, it's really daunting. You have to build these massive dishes to achieve a, a relatively poor uh, angular resolution compared to what you can get in the visible. So what's often done to get around this then is you're gonna build an array of telescopes. And this is the, the ALMA array, uh, for instance, that's shown here. So these are a bunch of these dishes separated out in space. And what's used for this array, it's called radio, interfer for, sorry, radio interferometry. So your angular resolution is the wavelength of light now divided by the baseline. And the baseline is the separation between your telescopes, right? So you don't need to build um, something larger than Arecibo, this 300 meter behemoth that you can't even move. Uh, instead, you can build two smaller telescopes that are separated by 300 meters or even more distance. Um, so that's how you, you improve your resolution. Now, there's, there's no free lunch. The issue is you don't increase the collecting area. So you can get high resolution, but you, know, you can't look at very bright objects with these arrays. Um, but that's still often worth the benefit, right? You increase the resolution, and also you can have a dish size that's more manageable, and so you can actually point it around, as opposed to something like Arecibo that just was fixed in a mountainside. So the, the example uh, of the, the biggest of the big is something under construction called the, the um, whoops, the, that's the very large baseline array. That's not line, <laughs> a very large baseline array, VLBA. Um, you're, you're spaced out, you know, about as far as you can be, right? You gotta be on the same side of the earth because the earth's gonna block radio waves. And so this is where the telescopes are being constructed. And the baseline here, uh, the longest baseline is about 8,600 kilometers. And your wavelengths that you're interested in varies, but the longest is on the order of a meter for the, for the VLBA. So we can calculate our resolving power, 
and we get something like 10 to the minus 7, right? And that's that's pretty darn good. That is now competitive with the optical resolution of the Hubble Space Telescope. Um, this will often be referred to instead of this resolving power as the, um, the angular span on the sky that can be covered. And 10 to the minus 7 here is, uh, 10 to the minus 7 radians is 22 milli arc seconds is a more commonly used unit in astronomy. And uh, just so you know, the, the arc minute, this is 1 60th of a degree, and the arc second is 1 36 hundredth of a degree. And the reason this is more commonly used in astronomy is things are really far away, and so their angular span is really small. And so degrees and radians aren't very practical units. Instead, you know, you can use arc seconds and milli arc seconds, uh, for instance. And that is it for this brief introduction to ground-based telescopes for Astronomy 1000.